Hello and welcome. My name is Stacey Ward. I'm the CEO for PWSA USA, and we appreciate you joining us for July's Family Support Webinar, PWS Aging Research and Health Update. So this is the first part of a two-part series, with the second part being scheduled for next Tuesday, August 6th. So now let me introduce our speakers. Barb Dorn is a retired RN who continues to dedicate her time educating and advocating and supporting individuals with PWS and their caregivers. She's the mom of two sons, including Tony, who's 39 years old with PWS. Barb has served as past president of PWSA, and she's also a former crisis counselor for PWSA. She's currently part of the Family Support Work Group and has been president and program director for PWSA Wisconsin in the past. She now edits the Wisconsin Connection newsletter and serves as a volunteer consultant and educator for them. Barb has presented at numerous conferences and contributed to various publications and has done multiple webinars and educational presentations for us. Lynn Garrick, also known as Nurse Lynn, is the medical and research coordinator for PWSA USA. She's the mom of five, including her youngest son who has prader willi syndrome. Since 2007, Lynn has worked as the nurse and program director for AIM Community Services, which provides residential care for individuals with PWS. She is a board member for IPSO. She serves on their professional providers and caregivers board and the board for the Minnesota chapter. PWSA has been a valuable resource for Lynn since her son's birth, and she's committed to giving back by supporting the community through her expertise. <clears throat> Excuse me. So thank you both for being with us tonight. I'll share my screen and you guys can take it from here. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you. All right, is everyone able to see my screen? Can you guys see it now? Mm -hmm. Okay. You just let me know when you'd like me to. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. I know in the summertime, it can be extra challenging to break away and um, add another little thing to do. Um, so we can start by advancing to the next, next uh, screen. We have three objectives for this evening. The first objective is going to be to highlight some of the current research that's going on currently in, on aging in Prader-Willi syndrome. The second objective is um, I conducted a survey and I wanted to share with you the results of my survey on some of the most common health issues that have been reported by parents, guardians, and caregivers. And the third objective is going to be to start talking a little bit more about some of the health conditions that uh, we are seeing in people with Prader-Willi syndrome. So I'll be sharing uh, risk factors, um, screening and monitoring tools, as well as prevention and management strategies. And in this presentation, we'll be focusing on three main areas of health conditions. Next. So people with Prader-Willi syndrome are getting older. And here's a picture of Susan. And Susan is 74 years old. And she is the oldest person that we are aware of um, who is still living with Prader-Willi syndrome. If you happen to know someone who is older than 74 years old or is 74 years old with Prader-Willi syndrome, please reach out and share with us uh, their name and picture and any information you're able to share with us. We're, you know, always trying to kind of see where we're at with things in, in the aging process. People are growing older because we have improved our care for people with Prader-Willi syndrome. We have a greater understanding of their needs and their health issues. And um, so their life expect, excuse me, their life expectancy has gotten longer. According to the Foundation on Prader-Willi Research, about 60% of adults with Prader-Willi syndrome are living in their parents' home. So 40 are, are living yeah, outside of their parents' home. So there is also a spectrum of aging issues that are facing people with Prader-Willi syndrome as they age, just like you and I. So the lady next door may not have as many health issues as you or I may have, and we may be all be the same age. So 
it is an individual thing as well. Research has started, but we need more. And we are learning more every day. Next. There are factors that influence, influence aging, not just Prader-Willi syndrome. So first of all, our family history can impact how we age. If we have a family history of certain disorders, of certain cancers, cardiovascular disease, that's going to impact the person with Prader-Willi syndrome just as much as anybody else. Weight management also impacts uh, and influences aging. And this is true for all of us too. If we can keep our weight under control, we can minimize or prevent some of the chronic health conditions that can go along with being overweight. If the person has received hormone therapy during the course of their life, including growth hormone, estrogen, or testosterone, this will impact how they age. So the people of who are aging today, I believe are going to look very different than our children today as they age, because we have known much more about hormone replacement therapy and the access to hormone therapy has been greater. So um, I, I truly believe, and I see it just now in our children, how they look and act different because of all the benefits of hormone replacement therapy. These hormones impact muscle strength. If we have stronger muscles, we will have the ability to move much more easier. When we can move much more easier, it's going to impact our, our health in so many different ways. Bone health is also impacted by those hormone therapies, and that too is going to impact some of the development of some of the chronic um, conditions that can be a result, and uh, that can result in uh, disability and impaired ability for mobility, lots of illities here, um, or for the person with Prader-Willi syndrome. So there are factors that influence the aging process. Next. So what do we know about Prader-Willi syndrome? We know that diagnosing health conditions is very difficult. Um, as I, When I take my son into a doctor's appointment, the first thing I will say, especially if it's an urgent care is, Tony can be a diagnostic challenge. Their bodies work different especially in the area of pain and fever, which are two main criteria in trying a, for a condition, clinician to try and be able to diagnose a problem. Many of the adults with Prader-Willi syndrome are poor historians and have problems really explaining their symptoms. Because of that, there is often a delay in identifying and treating health issues. And oftentimes, sad to say, issues are ignored. I can tell you over the years, I've been advocating for people with Prader-Willi syndrome, not only across the state of Wisconsin, but oftentimes across the United States. And many times I hear parents and caregivers and guardians say, well, they're just trying to get attention. Or it's just Prader-Willi syndrome when it's not. And it turns out to be a serious health condition. There are a spectrum of health issues that, are, um, that these individuals will face. And that's what we're gonna be talking about not only tonight, but also next week. Next. Oh, I'm up. So <clears throat> as Barb mentioned before, we need a, more research in aging. There's just not a lot out there because right now we're seeing people living into their 60s, 70s. Um, be, this is really the first time in history that we're seeing that. So there really hasn't been much research done um, in the past. And I'm hoping that now um, there will be more and more focus on all things aging and research into that. So as we know, aging is characterized by a time-dependent functional decline of tissues and telomere shortening. So Telomeres are, I think of those little double helix DNA strands right there as me like your shoestrings. Those are those plastic caps on the shoestrings that are protective of our, our DNA. And as we age, they do shorten. And so we hypothesize now that our 
individuals with Prader-Willi syndrome have an, a predisposition to even shorter telomere length, which would predispose them to early onset aging. So aging a little bit faster um, than the typical population. So that might play a role. And that was a study done in 2020. Uh, next study or next um, alterations in the brain structure associated with the syndrome also um, that are think about um, studies some studies have shown that the people with uniparental disomy might be predisposed to early onset dementia more so than the deletion folks there's not a lot of studies out there on that so we definitely need more alterations in the brain structure associated with the syndrome as a direct result of absent expression of the genes and the like barb said the metabolic complications and those very complicated hormone things might be a cause of early onset of physical uh, physiological and brain aging um, one study did show that uh, on average the brain age was 8.7 years higher than their chronological age so if i'm 50 my brain might look like i'm almost you know 59 or 60. Um, and this this last one that i'm i'm citing here a study with only 12 individuals so not a large sample size um, they hypothesized that premature aging does occur in our individuals and that from the age of 40 on, we should really be doing, making sure that as caregivers or providers, we're advocating for those individuals to get good, good health checkups, that we know what exactly we should be queuing in on. You know, maybe like Barb mentioned that bone health, making sure we're getting those DEXA scans done every five years, uh, making sure that we're checking their thyroid, you know, respiratory functions, things like that that we know uh, cardiovascular function so that we as caregivers and um, providers can advocate for those testing, that routine testing that might not be done if we weren't advocating for that. So. Next slide. Oh, Barb. This is the, yeah, this is the result of my survey. When I started um, trying to do the research to see what's out there, what, what should we be talking about when we do this webinar? Um, I found that there wasn't a whole lot about what specific health issues are, are people with Prader Willi facing. So I put out a survey. I put out one to parents and guardians, and I also put one out to uh, residential care providers. I wanted to know what health issues I should be focusing on in, when we're doing this presentation. So thank you, thank you to all the parents and guardians that uh, responded to this survey. I had 89 individuals complete the survey. So we had ages of persons. Uh, I did originally just request for people ages 30 and older. I did have four people under the age, but I didn't disregard what they shared with me. Um, this isn't really scientific sort of study. It was more just to help me identify what health issues and what topics. Um, most of the people that responded were uh, had people with Prader-Willi in the age range of 30 to 39. And we did have one uh, respond that was over 60. We had 40 males, 49 females, that this reflects their, their health issues. So first of all, I, I looked at what were the top chronic health conditions. And, and according to the Academy on Aging, um, I identified their top 10. And these are the ones that were the top ones um, th that were identified in my survey. Diabetes was number one. High cholesterol and depression were kind of tied for number two. And high blood pressure was number three. There were other ones mentioned, but they had much fewer numbers. Then I asked about anecdotal uh, health issues, and I call them anecdotal because those are the ones that as uh, parents and guardians and caregivers that we can see, we can observe and talk about um, and report on, but might not be the typical aging issues that people necessarily um, are in the, the literature. And so the number one um, health issue that was identified for people with Prader-Willi was dental issues. 
Second was constipation. And then kind of tied was uh, second is osteopenia and osteoporosis. The next one was mobility issues. And the last one was worsening mental health. Then I asked, so are you noticing signs of early aging? And I was a little surprised. Um, 54 uh, said no, that they hadn't noticed it. And 32 said yes. And I had two that said, what there was no response for. Then I was trying to figure out, okay, I, I need to prioritize. Uh, you know, I can't talk about everything, even though we are talking about a lot of topics over the next two weeks. Um, what are the most concerning health issues that you're facing when you're caring for the, the adult with Prader-Willi syndrome? Weight management was number one. Worsening mental health and dental issues were tied for number two. Diabetes was number three. Mobility was number four. And cardiac and vascular issues was the last one. So this was the parents and guardian survey results. Next. This is the results of the survey from the residential care providers. So there might have been some overlap of some people that were on both, but because I wasn't doing the you know, a clinical research study, and I was still, um, you know, really looking at what people thought were the number one health issues. Um, I didn't worry about that, to be honest with you. So the number of providers that submitted their surveys was relatively low. It was at nine. Um, the Ages of persons with Prader-Willi, um, in this survey, we were able to get a few more older than 60, uh, but range five were in the 30 to 39, and then tied were uh, the 40 through 59 with, each, with six individuals. The genders were just about even, 10 males and 11 females, and they their top chronic illnesses were depression was number one, high cholesterol, number two, diabetes, number three, and then all of the bottom, high blood pressure, heart disease, and arthritis came in um, with all two of them. We don't have a whole lot of numbers there to, to um, rely on, but most important was what health issues are we seeing. Um, the top anecdotal health issues or the more prouder really specific health issues Number one was the osteopenia, osteoporosis. Next was constipation. Then came dental issues. And then last was uh, mobility issues and bowel incontinence. Once again, are you noticing early signs of aging? And it was almost high. Four said no, not really. And five said yes. The most concerning were constipation, bowel issues, and it's bowel obstruction, so that GI tract not working well. Then I had a few people identify seasonal Prader-Willi syndrome issues in the fall and the spring. So I reached out to say, you know, what, what did you mean by that? Um, and I'm thinking just from the response I get, it, it's more of a change in mental health issues. Um, which if you're dealing with people who have any sort of uh, bipolar tendencies or diagnosed bipolar disorder, fall and spring, when we change the amount of sunlight that they're um, experiencing, oftentimes it, they can run into exacerbations uh, of symptoms during that, during that time. Weight management was um, the last issue that they identified as being most concerning. Some other things that they wanted to share, and there were other things from parents, and I do appreciate, I heard lots of stories um, and probably frustrations with the medical system as well. Um, I did kind of lump it into here with the providers saying that things that they were really frustrated with was the lack of knowledge by healthcare professionals especially in emergency departments and in the inpatient hospital. They said they also were having increasing frustration in finding exercises that their older uh, residents could do. And they were also frustrated with weight gain in that on home visits. So this is just kind of a 
a little editorial to make sure that we're doing our best to keep the weight off when they come home for a visit. Um, so some of the, the health issues that we're going to be discussing tonight are dental issues. And then I kind of lumped three of them into one and calling it the slow gastrointestinal function. And then the final one that we'll talk about tonight is diabetes. Next. We can go to the next one. Stacy. Stacy. Hello. She's the guard guard for the slides tonight. <laughs> oh. Well, something happened here. Um, let me see if I can screen share. Okay. And I can take it over here. Let's see. Uh and then we just need the next one. That's not me. Okay, with the, the, oh, oh, there she goes. There we go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Um, the first topic we're going to talk about are dental issues. And the probably the four most concerning issues are extreme dental wear, cavities, abscess teeth, and limited access to dental care. Um, what I've done is I've kind of divided things up into categories that for us to kind of be consistent in talking about it. And so what are specifically are the risk factors involved in Prader-Willi syndrome? Well, we all know that um, adults and children with Prader-Willi have that abnormal saliva, that thick, sticky saliva. And that can, um, in some cases, contribute to dry mouth and can continue, it can contribute to um, cavities. Many of the people with Prader-Willi syndrome also have poor dental habits. Um, in addition, <clears throat> it can have horrible grinding um, and dental wear. I guess I didn't appreciate it as much when my son was younger. Um, he, you could hear him grinding in the next room. We did end up getting um, a bite guard for him I think around the age of 10, um, but it, he still um, has extreme dental wear on his teeth. Diet can contribute also to um, putting them at higher risk for dental problems and poor dental coverage by Medicaid, especially when our children transition from possible dental coverage under their parents' health care coverage into going into. Uh, Medicaid, Medicare coverage um, at various stages um, that could be added to the poor dental coverage. In general, dental coverage isn't the best. Even when you have the best policy, it's very expensive and it doesn't always, um, you know, cover everything 100%. The things we need to do as far as screening and monitoring is making sure that they have dental exams at least every six months. Most insurance plans will only cover it every six months. I do know of some people who were able to have their dentist write prescriptions that they needed it three times a year and they submitted it and to their dental provider and were able to get it three times a year, but that's um, more of the exception. Um, we need to be monitoring enamel. My son, when he was about 11 years old, went into the dentist and he went in every six months and never had an uh, enamel problem. And the dentist came out to the waiting room with the most horrible look on his face. And I thought, oh my goodness, what's the news going to be? And he had eroded over that six month period of time, all of the enamel off of his teeth. Um, we then had to go in for a GI workup to figure out what we, what had happened um, because of that severe dental wear. If anyone with Prader-Willi syndrome is complaining of pain or sensitivity to any of their teeth, that is a call for an immediate evaluation. Unfortunately, more often than not, they don't complain of sensitivity and pain and things 
get to a very uh, extreme situation before we know they even have a problem. So any sign of pain or voicing of pain or sensitivity requires a dental examination. As far as prevention and management, get those dental exams. If you can get sealants on them, anything to try to protect it, fluoride treatments, prompt evaluation of those enamel issues. For my son, we did find out that he had severe GERD. He was placed on medication. We elevated the head of his bed. Um, you know, we, we took steps to try to um, decrease the, the GERD symptoms. A bite guard, and you have to be patient with it. You have incentive programs. Some time with the bite guard on is better than no time. I tell parents, try your best to use their OCD to your advantage. If you can get that uh, into their daily routine, you have a better chance. And it, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, I know through experience. Um, but now he will not go to sleep or he will not go to bed without his bike guard. It is a part of his routine. A strong emphasis on dental care. And I know one of the, some of the comments that I heard um, on my survey was they can't get them to do to brush their teeth. Have them go pick out fun toothbrushes. Let them pick out toothpaste, um, sticker programs, any sort of incentive program that you can get them to brushing their teeth. Make it fun. Maybe music to brushing their teeth. Um, we just strong emphasis on getting that dental care into their daily routine. Next. Barb, I was going to just hop in real quick. Yeah. That GERD that you were saying, that's the gastrointestinal reflux disorder. Right, so that's when right. the acid comes up and that is what wears away at the enamel. So if your dentist is saying erosion of enamel, think that that might be a cause is that that acid that's eating away at the enamel of the teeth. Thanks, Lynn. That was it. Okay. Some ideas for accessing dental care. Um, locate schools that educate and train dentists and dental hygienists. Um, a lot of times they will have free clinics at those programs or very reduced cost. Investigate any free dental clinics or free dental events. I know I was surprised to learn that here in the town that we live in, in Oconomowoc, has a free dental clinic. We're not a really big community. Um, we used to take advantage of free dental events. Sometimes a, a local group of dentists within a larger metropolitan area might offer uh, two days in the fall that they offer a free dental clinic. Even if you can get one dental free, a free dental event a year is wonderful. Um, one thing I've noticed when, in going into Medicare is we now have um, ponies on Medicare because we are on Medicare and there are some advantage programs that now he can participate in the Medicare Medicaid advantage programs that include better dental coverage. He now gets $2,400 a year toward his dental care. So we have just recently started doing some restorative care for him. It's going to take baby steps, um, but, you know, there's just another option to be out there looking. Some Special Olympic organizations offer free dental services. So check with your local organization to see if there's, if there's offerings in your area. Private dental offices may also have plans that you can purchase and you may be able to negotiate their fees with that. You know, with the uh, donated dental services in your dental associate, I think I forgot, I forgot that one. Check your state dental association for a program called Donated Dental Services. This we took advantage of um, kind of during that period between when he was just on Medicaid until he came on our Medicare program. Um, and we approached our dentist, the, the dentist that we had been going to for him, and asked if he would be willing to, to make Pony a part of the, if he would donate his 
dental services and become a part of the program. And he offered to do it. And so it doesn't hurt to ask. And many times they will um, be willing to do that for you. Okay. The next aspect we're going to, or topic we're going to be talking about is slow gastrointestinal functioning. In general, people with Prader-Willi syndrome have a slow gut from their mouth to their butt. Um, they can have swallowing difficulties, which puts them at very high risk for choking. They can have gastroparesis, where there is slow stomach emptying, and then there can affect the intestines, where they have con uh, problems with constipation. So from mouth to butt, it functioning the muscles, musculature, and the GI system is just very slow moving. Next. The first topic we're going to talk about is choking. And with choking, there's a high risk of aspiration and even death. The risk factors involved in people with Prader-Willi syndrome include the hyperphagia and the fast eating. We know that that can be a, a lifelong problem for many of them. They have poor oral motor control and swallowing difficulties. We have research to back that up and, and show that they truly do have um, an altered musculature and really even sensation when they have food caught in their throats. They have that low muscle tone throughout the entire gastrointestinal tract. And we know given the opportunity, many of them will have a binge episode. And when they have a binge episode, they're going to try and take in as much food as possible and as fast as possible. So that puts them at risk of choking as well. We also know that they have that very, very thick saliva and a dry mouth. When we do not have moisture and lubrication, that uh, can impact their ability to swallow. And it's just like, can get stuck and dry. The dryness can cause it to um, get stuck and cause choking. Any repeated episodes of pneumonia should be evaluated because it could indicate that they are um, aspirating and uh, going into the lung and that is a, a form of pneumonia called aspiration pneumonia. So screening and monitoring is people that are fast eaters who are at high risk for choking that may have choked once or twice need to be monitored while they're eating. Um, if they're having repeated episodes or really any episodes of choking, or coughing after eating, they should be evaluated by a healthcare professional. And in most cases, then they will have a swallow study done to really look at the mechanics of their swallowing and seeing if things are getting stuck or if things going into the lung at all. Next. As far as prevention and management, what we want to do is try and soften the foods. Um, so any vegetables should be cooked so that they're softened. We want to avoid raw vegetables because those are just so easily caught in the in the throat. We want to try to lubricate the food that they're they're swallowing. You can add broth or liquids to ease and help with the the swallowing mechanism. There is a uh, practice called pace and chase, and that is where you follow all food with water or some sort of liquid. What we're trying to do is one, lubricate and help um, the passage go smoother and also to moisten anything in there and then uh, kind of give you an, an extra muscle boost after they're having um, a solid food go down. You wanna make sure that you're cutting all food into small pieces. Uh, you can serve small quantities at one time, and then they may get seconds. This is something that we did with our son. He was a fast eater, and we tried the putting the fork down, and this did not really seem to do be very successful. So what we did is we gave him smaller quantities of food for his firsts, and then he was able to then have seconds, but then we just basically took one helping and, and put it into two. So he didn't um, 
eat quite as much at one time. So once again, supervising the person during eating. Some people, especially people who are aspirating on their, their foods with swallowing, may um, benefit from thickening their food. Aspiration pneumonia occurs more often with liquids than it does with softened foods. So what we do is we try to make the liquids be kind of like a softer food. And there is a products out there that's a thicket or a thickening to um, help provide a little bit more um, substance when they're swallowing it. Anybody who is caring for the person with prader willi whether it's a caregiver, a parent, a babysitter, a grandmother, uh, must know how to do the Heimlich maneuver. Next. The next topic we're going to talk about is gastroparesis. And there are reported cases of gastroparesis in all ages of people with prader willi syndrome. And this is a condition where there is slow emptying of the stomach. And it can either be the slow contraction of the stomach or it just stops functioning. Um, and be, what happens is it results in a buildup of food. And then the, when the liquid and food remains in the stomach, the stomach starts to distend. When the stomach starts to distend, it can overstretch. It can rupture blood vessels. It can cut off blood supply to nearby organs. I do know of one individual who died because their stomach um, obstructed some major blood vessels. Um, and they're at high risk for rupturing and death can occur. And the risk factors for people with prader willi syndrome is that binge eating. It's where they're putting so much food in that stomach at one time that they're can almost be what seems to be like a shock to the system that it, it rather than speeding up because, hey, I got more in here, I better empty faster, it almost becomes overwhelmed and it stops working and it shuts down. The other risk factor that happens in people with prader willi syndrome is they don't vomit. So a lot of other people, when they get overfilled, will vomit it out. Unfortunately, uh, for people with prader willi syndrome, it is very rare to vomit. And any sign of vomiting indicates that there is a severe problem and they need to be evaluated. And I'll be going into that in the next um, slide. Another risk factor, if someone is prone to gastroparesis or slow gastric emptying, high fiber diets, which we think, oh, that'll help with constipation, um, can actually contribute to gastroparesis. Why? Because it high fiber requires the stomach to work harder. And when the work, stomach is required to work harder, it poops out, it stops working. So high fiber diets can actually be a risk factor for gastroparesis. And I'm not saying not to have fiber in their diet. I will say we have a lower, softer approach to uh, fiber and a typical lots of salad, lots of raw fruits and vegetables. That would be typically something we might um, advocate for a, a person not with Prader Willi syndrome. Next. So screening and monitoring. The big thing is to know the signs that require urgent medical evaluation, any sort of abdominal distension, pain, or vomiting. And when and if that happens, you need to urgently have this evaluated by a healthcare professional, and you need to go to an emergency department. This is one situation where going to an urgent care isn't the best solution. Why? Because they're going to require a very thorough workup, including a CAT scan. And typically, urgent cares don't have that type of extensive diagnostic equipment available. I do know that there's some emergency departments that can kind of function like half of it's an urgent care and half of it's an emergency department. So in those sorts of situations, um, you've got the emergency room right there and you've got your diagnostics available for you. Any sort of rumination, that burping up of the food, the regurgitation, that GERD, that reflux, um, 
needs to be evaluated. Um, and then a referral to gastroenterology um, as far as any sort of screening and monitoring. And one thing I didn't include, but always, always have your booklet with you. Um, this is your lifesaver. And I know um, many people, well, I have it downloaded. Well, when I go into an emergency department or I go into an urgent care, I always go right to the page that I want. I show it to them. I have them take a look at it. And then I ask for it back. I don't know about you, but I don't like handing my phone off and afraid that they're going to walk away with it. So you can download it. You can go right out to, you can go out to the website when you need to. Your phone, if that's the only option you have, use it. But um, these, it's worth, I have them in my, every one of my purses. I have, my uh, son has one. I have it in my car, um, in the glove compartment there. Because sometimes you're out and about and you get called to an emergency room, which has happened to me. So I've learned through experience. As far as prevention and management, report and monitor any episodes of regurgitation or, um, you know, reflux. And, and like Lynn was saying, any enamel changes. Oh. Um, get prompt evaluation of any abdominal distension, any pain, any vomiting. Um, if you have the diagnosis of gastroparesis and you're managing it, doing smaller feedings rather than large feedings at one time um, and making them chew. We want to make sure that all food is cut, cut up um, so that they're, we're really trying to save the stomach work. Like we said, when it gets overworked in people that are prone to this disorder, it can just stop working. So we want to try to uh, avoid high fiber foods. We want to encourage lower fiber, softer fiber, cooked vegetables, uh, mashed up foods. Um, the other thing we want you to, to do is after they're done eating, I know many of them love to go and take a little snooze. We would really like you to have them sit up afterwards, um, take a walk. That's even better because what we're doing there is walking kind of it will help promote the intestines to contract. And so with the intestines contracting, that helps the stomach contract and it's going to help move things through the stomach faster. In some cases, some cases, Medications may be prescribed um, to help with the, uh, to promote the stomach to contract and move forward a little bit more. Any other suggestions, Lynn, that you want to point out? No, I think you covered it. Okay, next. Okay, the next issue that is a lifelong health issue is constipation. And my belief is chronic constipation really needs oversight from a gastroenterologist or if you have a really good primary care doctor. Um, and I can tell you, I've worked for primary care doctors. I've worked for family practitioners. I've worked for internal medicine. And when it comes to constipation, they've seen the gamut. And one of the things I'm going to be advocating for is a bowel program. And they're very good at helping you develop one. But before I jump ahead, uh, the risk factors that we see in people with Prader-Willi syndrome, number one is obesity. And for any of us, if we're overweight and we have more um, fat in our abdominal area, that can put pressure on our intestines and that can slow their, their functioning and movement. So Obesity right away can contribute to a uh, risk factor for constipation. If we're not drinking enough water or liquids, that also, many people who you um, like to take um, high fiber products can oftentimes be causing constipation if they are not taking in enough water or fluids. So we need to make sure that we are not taking in too much fiber. So you want to balance, you say you want to have some fiber, 
but not too much fiber. And when you have fiber, you want to make sure you've got liquids. The other risk factor is that they have that low muscle tone from the entire gastrointestinal tract. They tend to have a low activity level. Some of the medications that they may be taking can cause constipation, especially if they're on any behavior modification, behavior management uh, medications. Those are um, prone to causing constipation. If they have other health problems, if they have a low thyroid, and as we age, our thyroid has a tendency, tendency to slow down. That's irregardless if you have prader willi syndrome or not. So that's something that has to be closely monitored. Once again, so the screening and monitoring aspect. We want to be monitoring their poop at least once a day, if not more often. I know in the my son is in a, a home where they do uh, monitoring twice a day. And they use the... Um, Bristol stool chart, which I'll show you here briefly to show them and say, did you have a, a BM? Yes. What would you say is the number? So they have to pick out what number um, for the, which gives you a guide as to was it hard? Was it medium? Was it soft? Um, so anyway, you, you got to stay in touch with the person's poop. It's just the reality. Um, being a nurse, I have no problems with being in touch with people's poop, you, you know, and you just got to kind of get used to it. You want to be monitoring any rumination or regurgitation. Sometimes, oftentimes, if we're really constipated, you can get that back up. And a lot of times when people go to the emergency room because of regurgitation, even nausea and vomiting, it may not be where they have gastroparesis, but they have severe constipation. So it, you can have that backup effect. You always have to rule out any other causes of intestinal slowing. Is it the thyroid? People with prader willi syndrome can also get colon cancer, so they have to have the, the routine screenings for colon cancer. And once again, urgently evaluating any signs of nausea, vomiting, or abdominal distension by a healthcare professional going to the emergency department. Next. So here's that Bristol stool chart. You can go online and you can do a Google search. You can download it and, and have it available to you. Um, you wanna know that the type ones and type twos are the ones that are the hard ones that are in need of interventions. Types three and types four um, usually are softer and okay. Once we're getting into the higher numbers again, then what can happen is, is that we can get, um, because of constipation, you can get even diarrhea. Your body's trying very hard to push the stool out. So it pulls water in and trying to get around the stool um, to get it out. Um, as far as prevention and management, keep the person moving. And even if they are having problems with mobility, even if it's very difficult, you got to get them up and get them moving. Some movement is better than no movement. Um, getting them just to walk down to the bottom of the driveway and back. 10 steps one day and maybe 12 steps the next day. The thing that's going to prevent them from getting, uh, suffering from a lot of medical complications is keeping them moving. The other thing is to make time for a BM. Sometimes they get so structured that um, they don't always take the time. Don't hesitate to schedule. And it's best if it's done after eating or after walking, because that's the natural time where our intestines are starting to move. So if we can kind of capitalize on it and say, after your walk, you can go and sit for five minutes. And um, I know my son used to say, but mom, I don't have to go. Well, let's just give it a try. But mom, I don't have to go. Well, you know, sometimes when we sit on a toilet, amazing things can happen. And by golly, nine times out of 10, amazing things did happen. Fluids. 
like I said earlier, that is imperative to helping to uh, keep the stool moist. Consult with a healthcare professional on the use of laxatives and develop a bowel plan. Many people with Prader-Willi syndrome do need a daily laxative and not all laxatives are created equal. Some of them have stimulants, some of them will be a softener, some of them will pull water in from surrounding tissues. And so your healthcare professional is gonna be the best one to judge. What do we do on a daily basis? And if they don't have a bowel movement after a day, what do we add to the, the plan? And if they don't have a bowel movement after two days, what do we add to day three? Some of them will have you do a cleanse. Some They may start off that way to make sure we're getting everything cleaned out, kind of like a colonoscopy prep. And some of them I've seen, I've worked with some doctors who will do this, especially people with chronic constipation who have some real issues, may do a cleanse every three months, six months, or nine months. So, um, you know, but having a plan in place. Um, there are medications that we have to be alerted for and be extra cautious and be on the alert for bowel movements even more so. And that's pain medications like narcotics. They have a tendency to slow the intestine down. And also medicines used to treat diarrhea. We have to be extra vigilant. Note, diarrhea may and can be a sign of constipation. So if they tend to be on the side of constipation and then all of a sudden they're having diarrhea, it may be related to the fact that they're constipated more than they actually have a problem. But I don't expect you to be diagnosing a lot of these things. Talk to your healthcare professional. Next. The last health topic that we're going to be talking about is diabetes. And I talk a little bit about pre-diabetes and diabetes, because um, if we can catch things early, then we're one step ahead of the game. So fasting blood sugar ranges, um, normal is 70 to 99. Once we get to 100 to 125, that's a condition called pre-diabetes. And that's when we're just kind of on the cusp of um, becoming a, di a, diabetic, a diabetic. And I'll talk a little bit about um, being pre-diabetic oftentimes is a result of our diet. And we have a better chance of turning things around if we can catch things in the pre-diabetes uh, phase. And type two diabetes is diagnosed at 126 or above. And I frequently have heard people say, well, he just has diabetes. and it just um, kind of goes against me as a nurse. Diabetes is a serious chronic illness. It impacts every organ in your body. It impacts your eyes. It impacts your blood vessels. It impacts your heart. It impacts your kidneys. It impacts your circulation. It is something that requires you to be extra vigilant on. It's a condition where uh, there's a problem where, from the where sugar is not being transported from the blood into the cells. And our body requires insulin for that transport to occur. In type one, and this is usually something we see more often in children and young people, and this is where the cells of the pancreas are typically destroyed by an autoimmune response where they're not making um, either little or no insulin. And that's where they usually do require an injection of insulin from a young age. Type 2 um, diabetes is one that can happen more often as we age, and it happens more often when we are obese, is the cells of the pancreas don't make enough insulin. So they are still capable, but it's not doing making enough to sufficiently transport that sugar into the cells. Some of these cells can also become resistant to the insulin. So the, you've got the insulin there, but it's uh, the pancreas is having to work harder and our cells are becoming resistant. 
Um, this is the type where sometimes um, if we can get the weight off and get a better diet, we can get you either into the pre-diabetes um, phase where maybe you can manage your diabetes with your diet alone or with oral medication. So some of the risk factors in Prader-Willi syndrome include obesity, poor diet management. If people are being given a high carbohydrate, high saturated fats, and a lot of processed foods, those can contribute to the development of diabetes. Over the age of 45, and that seems very young for me, um, our pancreas and parts of our body just don't work as well. But so age has an influence on um, the development of diabetes. If they're not real active, that low activity level. So people with Prader-Willi, we know that this is often a problem. If you have the diagnosis of prediabetes, that's a risk factor for becoming di having diabetes. If you have low thyroid, that can be a risk factor for developing diabetes. Um, medications, when you go on to steroids, so if you have another chronic illness where you may be on um, steroids, prednisone, um, I personally have rheumatoid arthritis and I am on and off of steroids um, in the course, that can affect blood sugars as well. So uh, medications definitely have an impact. Next. So screening and monitoring. Um, we need to evaluate signs of increased thirst, okay? People with Prader-Willi can have that dry mouth. So many of their normal symptoms of Prader-Willi can also be somewhat symptoms of diabetes, increased appetite, weight gain, increased thirst. Many people with Prader-Willi do not complain of high thirst, and that can be one of the early signs of having diabetes. When the person with Prader-Willi goes in for their annual checkup, we wanna make sure that they're having their fasting blood sugar checked. Uh, many of them will do an a, a hemoglobin A1C, which is basically, I'm gonna call it a fancy blood sugar test, but it can kind of take a look at blood sugar levels over time. And so they can tell over time if your um, blood sugar is rising, and that can indicate if your blood, if your um, insulin levels are, are struggling. You want it, they, you would want them to do what's called a metabolic panel where they're looking at kidney function. And that can be one of the organs affected by diabetes. And we want to take a look at all of the, the um, uh, metabolic numbers and to see if there's any indication of any problems. We want to continue to monitor their weight daily, stay on top of it. Um, when they're starting to gain weight, we need to be more vigilant. We also want to check their blood lipids, their cholesterols, their triglycerides, the healthy lipid, which is the HDL, or the lousy lipid, which is the LDL, the bad lipids. Um, that annual eye exam, remember I was saying? Diabetes can affect every organ in the body. So we want to make sure that we're staying uh, attuned to all the organs that could be affected by diabetes. And to monitor blood sugars as recommended by their healthcare profession. So prevention and management. The big thing is weight management. And unfortunately for all of us, our calories may need to be lowered as we age and as they age. And I know sometimes they're on a low calorie diet to begin with, um, but we might even have to go a little bit lower. And that's the same for you and I. As we age, we have less muscle mass. We have our metabolisms can oftentimes slow and we can gain weight a lot easier. Because of this, you may want to get a consultation with a nutritionist or dietitian, um, a low carbohydrate. A low glycemic diet is important. And a low glycemic diet is um, a diet that has foods in it that don't raise your blood sugar. And so a dietitian can go over kind of what your normal is and maybe provide you with some ideas of what can be some substitutions for that. You want to increase their activity and 
they may need medications, including insulin. And sometimes once we can get their weight under control, um, where oftentimes people are able to get off of insulin um, and may just still need oral or even diet management. You want to be seen by an endocrinologist, and this is a doctor that specializes in the management of diabetes. And many people with Prader Willi have other hormone conditions um, that benefit from seeing an endocrinologist as well. And I always uh, learn so much from a diabetes nurse educator. Um, so if the person that you're supporting or your loved one has diabetes, make an appointment to see a diabetes nurse educator. They have a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of tricks um, to things that can help you manage your diabetes. Next. Okay. So we have begun talking about the research that's going on and the aging issues that have gone on in people with prader willi syndrome. We are going to do another series uh, next week, Tuesday, and some of the health issues that we will be talking about next week include respiratory, weight gain and obesity, low bone density, cardiac issues, mobility, mobility issues and worsening mental health, low energy, and dementia. So I hope that you can join us. And um, now if you do have any questions, um, here are some resources as well, our medical alert book. And um, we have excellent um, family support counselors that can help you as well. And our website is provides a wealth of, um, of knowledge. Okay. Yeah, there was a couple questions. One was, you know, how do I go about getting this medical alert booklet if I, you know, don't download it from my phone or whatever, but I did put a link in the chat um, to the website and to the direct uh, link on how to purchase that at $6 and then we ship it out. Um, so that was one. Okay. Um, how do you find a, an advantage plan that uses their doctors is you call your well, first of all, how I did it, you can do a Google search because from state to state, it varies. And or really, you listen on TV in your local area and you can sometimes find they're, they're very good at advertising. Um, but what I did is I called that, I, I Googled it, found the phone number, and I called and I talked to a counselor. And the counselor was able to tell me, um, going through all of my son's doctors, which ones were in their program, which weren't. I think we out of, I think he has seven doctors. Um, I think initially all of his doctors were in their in the program. I also, when they did that, then they went over his medications because with it, it came a drug program in all of the medications that were in their program. So they were, the counselor was so um knowledgeable and and they and I did know that his eye doctor recently went out of network and now we're we're getting a new eye doctor but um is doing a search calling and talking to a counselor and then have the list of your um uh, loved ones in front of you their their doctors and a list of their medicines because those are the two two things that um um you know, are needed to make sure that you you can get one that it best needs you. Um, I can take the next couple ones. My thoughts on Wagovi and other weight loss medications and the other weight loss medications, I'm assuming that, uh, Grace, you're meaning the GLP ones. Um, so for people that have our loved ones with diabetes, we have done limited studies um, that the overall glycemic control benefits from that. However, for weight loss specifically, we have not found that it works like it does with if I took it, right? I would lose 30, 40 pounds. Um, what, the, what we're concerned about is that delayed gastric emptying that Barb talked about before that probably a more than, you know, probably pretty much all of our folks have some degree of delayed gastric emptying. 
So when you think of being full after Thanksgiving or whatever, your stomach is filled with food. We feel so full, right? Um, but with delayed, and then that would just work its way out. But with delayed gastric emptying, and that's how these these medications work, it delays that. So we feel full, right? But our folks don't feel full. And our folks eat, can eat too much if we don't stop, you know, have food security. So the danger is you're piling food on food on food on food. And that can lead to that gastric rupture or those other, you know, those other things that Barb was talking about. So it could be quite dangerous um, for some of our folks. And that's what we're concerned about. So not all, but people um, that would be dangerous for, but that is a concern. Um, uh, pre, uh, pre diabetes A1C levels are now, uh, okay. So normal A1Cs are less than six. So, um, my son was 5.6 and went up to 5.8. Wanted him to start on medication. Yep. Um, I asked to test again in three months, hesitant to add another medication until the A1C went above. Yeah, at, at a, a level of above six, you're looking at definitely, you know, diabetic range there. So a normal A1C for a non-diabetic is less than six. I hope that answers that. Uh, Nestle thickens... Nestle thicken up a clear thickener, only five calories per eight ounces. That's thank you for that. So um, yeah. thickeners add calories. You know, if you're thickening, some of our folks are on, you know, dysphagia diet, like honey thickened, and you're thickening every single thing that adds a lot of calories. So this, this anonymous attendee says Nestle's thicken up only has five calories for eight ounces. So that's good if your loved one right. is using a thickening agent to make sure that you're accounting for some of those calories. Um, do I find the, uh, no, yeah, using thickener, yep. <laughs> I think anytime we find a product that is lower mm -hmm. calories is, is great. Um, do you find... Carter-Willi syndrome, people do a lot of burping. That would yep. be concerning. Um, <laughs> that may be indicating that they are regurgitating, that they are having some, um, you know, um, reflux, the acids are coming up. Um, so that would be something that you would want to share with your doctor um, and have evaluated. Because I think to add on to that too is those foul smelling burps. Um, for some of our folks, when they're burping a lot and doing that, they're getting fuller, 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 fuller of food. They're getting impacted. They might have a small bowel obstruction. They're not, you know, those types of things. They're building up with gas and, and food. So if you're smelling those foul, like, wow, you need to, I can't even be around you. Um, that might be an indication <laughs> too of a trip to urgent care ER, um, to evaluate for small bowel obstruction or something worse. All right. Thank you, guys. If there are any other questions, please feel free to throw them in the Q&A. Um, if not, Lynn and Barb, thank you so much for this. I'm looking forward to part two.